Welcome to our live discussion. I'm Dawn Wright, Esri Chief Scientist, and this is a live stream about the role of GIS in ocean conservation. Ocean conservation, because I know all of you out there are, are really excited about what happened yesterday with the Mars rover, Perseverance. That was a fantastic uh, display of technology and ingenuity and innovation and inspiration. But did you know that we had the equivalent of a Mars Perseverance, Perseverance event last year in June when we sent uh, several more people to the deepest spot in the entire planet uh, to Challenger Deep. Not very many people heard about that, but it happened and it's an amazing story. So I'm going to provide for you uh, the story map about what happened last year. It's related to ocean conservation and then also for uh, a nice little gift, we also have a new Mars, uh, Explore Mars app that Esri has done with uh, NASA JPL. But again, we are here to talk about the role of GIS in ocean conservation. And I am so excited to have with me today, National Geographic Certified edu Educator, Sandra Turner. So welcome, Sandra. This is awesome. I'm so excited about doing this with you. And uh, th we thank you so much for joining us. And before we get started, we would love it if you could tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Thank you, Dawn, for having me. This is such a pleasure. Uh, like I said, I am a national, a proud National Geographic Certified Educator. So big up to all of my education and my educators and students who are listening in today. I'm also a global climate change leader who trained under Al Gore back in 2017. I teach climate science and ocean literacy to students in elementary grades. I'm what's considered an informal educator. I take resources and activities to where my students are. Prior to COVID, uh, uh, you know, that, that was in libraries and boys and girls clubs, churches, and sometimes even dining room tables. Essentially, um, I am where my students are, and that is generally in communities that don't always have access to environmental education. When I'm not teaching, I am generally traveling and doing independent research on hurricanes and their impacts on communities across the Caribbean. I'm curious and uh, very concerned with what happens to children, uh, their well-being, and the disruption of their education in the aftermath of destruction, destructive hurricanes. Lastly, I am a member and instructor of an amazing organization called Diving with a Purpose and have recently been asked to introduce GIS into our youth diving program, so that's awesome. I love the ocean, and I love the Caribbean islands. So, Speaking of the islands, we have a little bit of trivia for our guests today, Dawn. Yes, to help frame our discussion. So, um, and how, how this is going to work is I'm going to read the, the question and uh, also allow time for people to enter the responses into the chat. And then yes. um, I'll read the, read the question. So, yes, ready, Dawn? Reveal the answer, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> okay, so the question is, what is an island? And uh, very simple, what is an island? And while the answers are going into the chat room, I'm gonna play a little island music. Is a I could listen to that all day because I love <laughs> So how are we doing in the chat? What is an island? This is a question again. Okay, you ready, Dawn, for the answer? We're ready. Looks like the answers uh, have been coming in. Uh, 
Sorry, I muted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think uh, I think in the interest of time, we're we're ready for an answer, and then the answers will continue to come in, okay. and uh, that can be part of our discussion. So, just to let everyone know, the answer is uh, taken from Don's recent uh, book called GIS and Science. So I'm going to read it because it's, it's beautiful poetry. So again, the question is, what is an island? All land masses on earth, no matter how big, are surrounded by oceans. All are therefore islands, no matter, excuse me, that means we are all islanders. It is not the case that islands versus mainlanders, we all live on islands whether we see or feel that reality on a daily basis. For all of us then, islands are our homes. So we must know them and take care of them. Yes. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Sandra, for, for bringing up the, uh, the subject of, of islands. You and I uh, are, are from smaller islands, but I think it's a fantastic concept for all of us to know that we are all in this together and surrounded uh, by planet ocean. Yes. And so uh, this is going to be a, a fantastic uh, subject to discuss. We're so happy to have you discuss this subject that's near and dear to your heart and to my heart uh, about conserving uh, this, this ocean that surrounds us mm -hmm. and the role also that the GIS, Geographic Information Systems, which has a location intelligence is mm -hmm. playing uh, in these in these efforts. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we get into uh, the questions that we are receiving over social media, I have a few for you, Sandra. Let's let's start off with a with a first round of questions just between mm -hmm. the two of us, yes. which will be great. Yes. So one of the big things that that has happened uh, in recent years, and particularly in last year, is how closely Esri and the National Geographic Society uh, have been working together. And mm -hmm. we, both of our organizations have been providing resources for teachers. And mm -hmm. this is so uh, vital, especially in the age of, of COVID now. Mm -hmm. So would you be able to just take a few minutes to share your experience as an educator who has found GIS, mm -hmm. and the role that GIS has played in what you do to help teach about conservation and inspire students to take action. Yes, sure. So I first learned of Esri and GIS last summer while looking for resources to complement my online learning activities. I work with a group of tech savvy fifth graders. So I was under a lot of pressure to find things that were challenging for them. So whenever I need fresh ideas and resources to create lessons, I check to see what's sparked the attention of National Geographic's Chief Education Officer, Dr. Vicki Phillips. I happened upon a YouTube video with her and your very own CEO, Jack Dagerman, in conversation about the collaboration between the two organizations. From there, I decided to jump in and start learning some of the basics of GIS. My students were already working with traditional maps, map maker, globes, and Google Earth. So GIS was a natural transition for them. Having now mastered the fundamentals of ArcGIS, my students are working on their own maps, making their own maps using elements of cartography, working with various layers in living world, uh, the living atlas of the world. And soon they'll be creating their very first multimedia story maps to share what they've learned about the ocean, the SDGs, and how young people can help save the planet. Now, Dawn, how cool is that? Yeah. It's absolutely vital. <laughs> yes, yes. Very cool. Yeah. And also the peers will see story maps for the very first time. Um, many people, many students haven't seen story maps, so they'll be the first to share this within their schools and also within their neighborhoods. So I'm really excited about uh, what uh, we can do with these combined resources for our students. Yes. Oh, and there's so much, uh, you know, an hour is not going to be enough <laughs> with all of the resources that we, that you and I have to share and that the uh, others in the audience who will be sharing the same thing and story maps is right up there. Yeah. Uh, 
top because it covers the gamut from K through K through gray, uh, as yes. we say, in terms of uh, the educational spectrum. And the other thing about uh, story maps and some of these other resources is that we can bring our own experiences mm -hmm. uh, right to the forefront of it, mm -hmm. uh, especially with uh, videography and, and photography. And mm -hmm. I know you're, you, you're a diver, you, you've talked about that before. Yes. And diving is so amazing because of how you experience the ocean in a personal, visceral way. Yes. So uh, I, I'm a diver too, but my diving is, is a little bit more complicated because Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to use the submersibles, <laughs> oh, okay. not yeah. in Lego, but real submersibles. <laughs> but <laughs> as you as you have dived uh, in the ocean, can you just take a little while to tell us what has it taught you about uh, ocean conservation? And is there a specific aspect of conservation uh, that diving has highlighted or confirmed for you uh, that's so important? Oh, Don, that's a that's a tough question. Um, first, um, you know, it's it's um, being submerged in the ocean is a humbling experience, uh, in the sense that it is a beautifully vulnerable place position that you place yourself in this vast, unpredictable environment. Um, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. I joined diving with a purpose. Uh, that again is outstanding organization that many many will recognize diving with a purpose because of its archaeological work, uh, looking for sunken from slave ships. Mm -hmm. But uh, very few know that uh, diving with a purpose has a coral reef restoration program. And I joined to learn how to survey and to restore coral reef in the Caribbean. Understanding that a healthy reef system can be a first line of defense against uh, strong storage uh, storm surges, hurricanes, coastal erosion, and um, I just thought it was essential to join initiatives to help build resilience around these coastal communities. So the human side of coral reef restoration is the area of uh, ocean conservation. Ocean conservation, that's most important to me. Um, in my travels across the Caribbean, I uh, heard countless stories of families being disrupted, uh, people having to leave the island because of loss of their home, loss of land, uh, the increase of poverty, uh, which creates an, um, an increase of crime. Uh, just entire, entire communities just uh, devastating. So, Diving is certainly for a purpose for me. Um, and again, the human side of coral reef restoration is what I'm most interested in. So mm -hmm. thank you for asking that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, what a fantastic organization. I, I would love to participate sometime. I, I have had a similar experience to yours, mm -hmm. but in uh, Hawaii and American Samoa. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. Samoa, especially after their big uh, earthquake and tsunami in 2009. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you see why this work is very important. Yeah, very important. Well, Don, now I have an opportunity to ask you questions. And um, I promise they won't be too hard. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, ESRI has made tremendous strides in helping organizations worldwide tackle our ocean's most pressing problems. A perfect example is the Ecological Marine Units, EMUs. I know that we have uh, some students and teachers tuning in this afternoon. Can you explain what EMUs are and maybe elaborate on some of the current projects that you're in involved in and using them with? Absolutely. One of the things about uh, the ocean that is so challenging is if you are not a diver, how can you experience uh, the ocean digitally? And that's really what the ecological marine units or EMUs are about. The EMUs are basically a three-dimensional base map uh, of the oceans. So your, your students are going to ex experience, especially with story maps, mm. all kinds of base maps. And the base maps that we provide in our technology is uh, two-dimensional. So you're seeing only the surface of things. But with the EMUs, this is an opportunity to experience that third dimension. 
And uh, this was something uh, that Esri built with a lot of, of care and a lot of research uh, in collaboration with a lot of other organizations, especially the US Geological Survey and mm -hmm. the University of Auckland in New Zealand uh, with NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, of course, because the EMUs are based on NOAA's authoritative World Ocean Atlas. Sure. Uh, we worked with the Marine Conservation Institute and, and many, many others. And what we did in this partnership is this digital product uh, is 3D for most of the ocean. Uh, mm -hmm. Horizontally, it has a level of detail of 27 kilometers across the surface of the ocean, but going down into the ocean, it covers about 102 depth zones down yeah. to 5,000 meters or three miles deep uh, in all of the oceans. And it's, it's a way to help us to get a handle on the ocean's ecology. Uh, what is driving that ecology? What is driving life in the ocean? So what you, we're really looking at here is a, a three-dimensional uh, clustering and characterization of six of the ocean's primary parameters. Temperature, mm -hmm. we all relate to that salinity or the saltiness of the ocean, oxygen, dissolved oxygen, and then nutrients, nitrate, phosphate, and uh, silicate. And uh, people have been using this as open data, and there are a series of apps uh, that are available to help uh, classrooms, teachers, scientists, conservation organizations experience that. So the, the apps, uh, the uh, URLs, the addresses will be available uh, in, the, in the chat. And we have a number of, um, of use cases that are underway. Uh, I'll just, in, because of the, uh, the time, the limited time, uh, I'll just talk about one uh, because it's related to ocean conservation. And the, the EMUs are actually used uh, as part of uh, NOAA's, it's NOAA's and BOEMS, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, their ocean reporting tool where you can uh, explore the ocean and then generate uh, reports so that you have a better understanding of the different uses of the ocean by transportation, by recreation, by fishing. Uh, mm -hmm. And the idea is to reduce conflicts in these various uses of the ocean, including in the areas that we're trying to conserve and protect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that uh, actually leads me to my second question. So what kinds of uh, ocean research or conservation efforts will you and ESRI be involved in this year? Any updates on projects or um, anything else that you'd like to share in terms of what's coming in the future? Yes. So uh, there are uh, the two numbers together, 30 by 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I hope our audience will hear much, much more about 30 by 30 on various levels. Uh, mm -hmm. President Biden and Vice President Harris uh, have issued, well, President Biden issued an executive order, uh, mm -hmm. 30 by 30, which is to conserve or protect 30% uh, of our nature by 2030. Uh, California uh, has a California 30 by 30 initiative. So we are uh, involved uh, in that on various levels, uh, mm -hmm. supporting uh, 30 by 30 efforts with our technology, uh, with our data. And uh, one of the specific ways uh, I'll talk about is uh, with NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas, uh, National Marine Protected uh, Center. Mm -hmm. and also with a, an organization called Protected Seas, which is out of the Anthropocene Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all about uh, understanding and maintaining and designating new areas for conservation uh, through the, the federal system, along mm -hmm. with the nonprofit system. And there is an absolutely wonderful webinar that was given just yesterday Mm -hmm. by uh, Mimi DiOrio of NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center. And she tells the story of this uh, protection in the U.S., in U.S. waters, uh, in the context of 30 by 30 in a beautiful story map. So that's yet another uh, story map that we can, we can explore 
and I'll put the link to that in the chat, but that's one of our, our big projects coming up. Very nice. Wow, that's incredible, John. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we could go on and on uh, <laughs> with, uh, with these awesome questions. Let's, uh, let's see if we can take a couple more questions uh, between the two of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we will we will go to the uh, to the chat here and see what the what the audience would like to to hear uh, from both of us. So Sandra, let's do this back and forth. I'm going to ask you a question now, and then you can ask me a question, and uh, we'll, we'll do that for for a couple of minutes. So uh, I would like to know, and I'm sure the audience would like to know, how did you get into your career? And what led you to your current position uh, at the National Geographic? Hmm, that's, that's uh, very good. Um, I would say um, the questions that I would get from young people as I would talk to them again, I, I spent a lot of time in the library and I would always stop students and say, hey, what do you know about the ocean? Or what do you know about climate change? And too often I would hear, um, disappointing responses so I'm like nothing or I don't know or what does it have to do with me or I'm not near the ocean and uh, I was troubled by that so I wanted to uh, find the, the framework to be able to work with children in my community to make sure that uh, they, they understood what was happening in the world and uh, to also kind of bridge that connection between where they are in the natural world so uh, that really was the, the catalyst to me. And uh, now I am an informal educator. Again, I don't have a classroom, but um, I spend, um, I devote my volunteer time, my discretionary time to, to doing this. And it has been very rewarding work done. And um, yeah, the, the young, it's amazing once they start, they don't want to stop learning. So I have to continually learn to, to train and uh, to uh, uh, find resources for them to keep them engaged. So what about you, John? You have a very interesting career. Can you tell us what, uh, what led you to oceanography and how you became the chief science officer with Esme? Well, I grew up uh, swinging from banyan trees in bare feet and running on the beach as a child in Hawaii. So that pretty much did it <laughs> as, as an islander uh, like you. And uh, so I grew up uh, loving the ocean, seeing and feeling and experiencing the ocean as a sacred place. Yes. And that led me to want to study it. And so I started off in more of a traditional academic career, uh, went to school and got all the degrees and finally uh, got a, uh, a degree in both oceanography and geography, which led me to, to be an educator at the college level, teaching at Oregon State University and teaching uh, quite a bit of GIS. Uh, on a lot of university campuses, there are uh, a couple of faculty who do the bulk of GIS instruction for, for the entire campus, mm -hmm. not for their departments. Uh, and so, so that's how I started off uh, at Oregon State. The situation at Oregon State is much better now because they have many faculty who are teaching GIS in many different departments. Mm -hmm. But I started off uh, doing quite a bit of GIS instruction across the campus and using ESRI technology uh, in, in my instruction, in my lab work and getting uh, introduced and entrained into the ESRI uh, community Mm -hmm. And also uh, trying to hold Esri to task a little bit in terms of, you know, Esri, and, and I wrote letters to Jack Dangerman, our, our CEO, uh, mm -hmm. about we need more three-dimensionality in the software. We mm -hmm. need more functions that will help ocean scientists as well as land scientists. And I wasn't sure if my messages were getting through, but one day I got a, uh, both a message and a call from Esri uh, and from, from Jack asking me to consider coming to Esri as the chief scientist to help them with some of these things that I had been asking on behalf of the ocean community, but also to, to be an advocate and a subject matter expert and uh, someone who could coordinate with the, uh, the scientific community across many different sciences, uh, climatology, climate science, hydrology, geology and geophysics, ecology, 
agricultural science, forestry, conservation biology, uh, geographic information science. So that became an offer that was too good to, to mm -hmm. mess up. Uh, and uh, I was able to, I, I'm still with Oregon State University, but I transitioned full time here in California with, with Esri. And it's, uh, I've been working that way since 2011. Yes. So yeah, yeah pretty, pretty amazing. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. So, Don, a, a question from you, for you, and this is, I apologize, it's a little off script, but uh, just a personal question that I've wanted to ask you as a, uh, a woman and a woman of color and your challenges uh, breaking into the field of oceanography. Can you speak just briefly about that, uh, what some of your challenges have been, and perhaps even, your, well, we know about your triumphs, but um, just something that you can yeah. share to, to others who, especially our young people who are listening in, who might be interested in a field as great as yours. Yes, well, uh, that's the question of the day now, isn't it? Because yeah. we, are, we are facing uh, so many examples of how the inequities and uh, the lack of diversity uh, in many aspects of our society and in many of our uh, decision-making levels uh, is really costing us. And uh, I have experienced that uh, in terms of always being the only one, uh, the only black female in my class or uh, in my program, or uh, even, even at Esri, I'll say that we are working very hard to increase the diversity of our organization. And uh, we, we have a long way to go there. And uh, I think uh, many of us have uh, experiences that we can share in terms of someone who has said, you can't do this, you shouldn't be here, you don't belong here, um, or you are, uh, you will, you're an exception. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll accept the fact that you're doing this work and doing it well, but that's not, that's not what your people are able to do, which is absolutely not true. So, uh, yes, we could have a whole other seminar on that, but that, that has been my experience. But uh, hopefully for you, too, there have been uh, people along the path, along my path, who have uh, th their voices in my ear have been much louder saying, you can do it. You should do it. Uh, this is something for everyone. Yes. Uh, ocean conservation, education saving the planet. It's something uh, that all of us uh, can do regardless of our background and your opening in terms of we are all islanders. And I loved this uh, Mae Jemison, who is the first American uh, African-American woman in space. She often says we are all earthlings. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what a concept, especially since we are uh, aghast at what's going on with uh, Mars rovers. Now we are all uh, earthlings. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you had a similar uh, experience in terms of of having some obstacles that uh, that you overcome and that you would like to share to encourage others? Absolutely, um, and I don't mind the challenges. I, I think um, sometimes you have to have a few challenges in order to uh, to break walls, right? Break through walls. I uh, as a climate uh, educator and often, uh, you know, I raise a few eyebrows, right? Mm -hmm. And um, again, like I said, I don't mind that. It's important to know that just as you echo, we all need to know about um, climate change. Um, all of our students need to be aware of what's happening with our environment. And that's the only way that we can make change. Um, as I actually started teaching about ocean, uh, science recently because of this disparity between the numbers of, or, or I should say, the, the responses that I would get from my children when uh, they would uh, draw pictures, for example, of the ocean. And it was a very difficult task for them. Um, and I started to think about ocean conservation as um, possibly um, a matter of affluence that uh, young children of color don't um, become involved with ocean conservation because they aren't often afforded uh, trips to uh, the beach or vacations to the Caribbean. 
And so uh, starting with their photos, I take them, I bring the ocean to them, right? And uh, through National Geographic resources, through Esri resources, and we go step by step by step, helping them to understand that the ocean, everyone is connected to the ocean, and everyone can be involved with ocean conservation. So again, um, uh, breaking those kinds of um, barriers, if you will, and um, helping students to know that everything is possible for you. Just go for it. And I think as educators, that's, that's part of our role to, to help them see different narratives and different possibilities for themselves. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy for the challenges because it just makes me I'm more determined as an educator. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So there are, we're getting so many, so many questions here and uh, let's see if we can get through, through the rest of these before we uh, pop it out to uh, live questions. But an another great question that has come in, uh, ocean conservation is an expansive topic mm -hmm. uh, when teaching and encouraging students to take action. Where is a good place to start? And what about students that are not near an ocean? And you, you've touched on this a little bit, uh, Sandra, could you expand a little bit more? Yes, and uh, again, I, I really love this question. Thanks for asking. Um, and uh, just as we started in the beginning, uh, regardless of where we are geographically, our proximity to the ocean is as simple as breathing. And actually, I think I tweeted that this morning. Uh, the ocean is a cradle of life, right? And the ocean is what makes living on this beautiful blue planet inhabitable. And by providing us oxygen through marine photos, synthetic organisms, and this, this science, it's, it's uh, you know, not to get too heavy in the science, it's just important for uh, uh, young people to know that taking, ocean on, taking action on ocean conservation can happen right where they are. Mm -hmm. And I'd say one place to start is by learning about the dangers of unrecycled plastics mm -hmm. and how they find themselves from land to sea, right? Um, you know, so often driving or walking, you see people just kind of throwing things on the ground or out of their wind car windows, not really realizing that, you know, it, it's going somewhere, right? Um, so I think that's a good place to, to start with uh, uh, teaching young people about ocean conservation, aside from, again, teaching them about this, this, this human connection mm -hmm. they all have to the ocean that's essential. Um, uh, and and uh, I think the other parts we've already touched on in terms of um, having equal access to the knowledge, right? Yeah, I, th I think it's great that you, you bring up the, the plastic problem because mm -hmm. that is, is ever with us. And uh, this, this next question, maybe I could try to, to take the next couple of questions because they are uh, related to uh, our observational technologies that we use to, to see what's happening in the ocean, such as the prevalence of, of plastic. Mm -hmm. We can certainly see it on the surface, uh, via some, sometimes via satellite if the patches are large enough, but certainly with drones, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole combination of, of drone surveillance mm -hmm. uh, with GIS. Oftentimes, uh, we tend to think of GIS as an observational technology. So this question is, can GIS satellite and drone surveillance capabilities help the world's oceans? Most certainly. Uh, but what I think is really exciting is that satellites and drones provide data for GIS which can then do the mapping and the, and the analysis and then further mapping uh, the results of that analysis to show us where, for instance, there are hot spots uh, of these problems uh, mm -hmm. in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the, uh, because the ocean is uh, so dynamic, these hot spots are going to, to change through time. And GIS now mm -hmm. has the capability to do the temporal analysis uh, too. So I'm, I'm going to just move into uh, another, another question uh, that's related to that. Can GIS or any remote sensing techniques be used to identify different species in the ocean as they are in constant motion? Uh, again, 
We, we can use remote sensing from satellites, uh, from airplanes, uh, but also I would say that remote sensing uh, extends to diving. Mm-hmm. So uh, maybe this is a question that both of us can, can take from that standpoint too, because mm-hmm. if we are uh, getting these images, these snapshots or these videos, especially videos with things that are in motion, uh, then we can put that into into the GIS to analyze. So have have you had uh, good experiences there as well, especially with uh, diving photography or videography that you've incorporated into uh, GIS and then taught that to your your students? No, I haven't. But here's the wonderful thing. I know that as we, um, I believe it's on the 24th of February, we'll be teaching a course or yeah. hopefully a webinar on remote sensing. And this is really key to my diving with a purpose, uh, young divers. Um, they will be learning how to map coral, right? and using remote sensing for this purpose. So again, as uh, and, and this is advice that I would give to any educator who's interested in diving in or working with GIS in the classroom, you have to learn the tools before you can teach them. So it's um, it's just one, <laughs> just another thing that I need to do in order to give the, 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 the tools to my students. And um, so I'm looking forward to that class and seeing where we go with it. And um, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you for bringing up that webinar too, because that is going to be great. And perhaps our, our colleagues have already put that the link to that webinar in the chat for, for our audience. Uh, and there'll be many, many more webinars uh, like that, uh, thankfully. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think related to that are all of the, the learn lessons, uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the self-study lessons that will help uh, people of all different backgrounds in terms of their familiarity with the technology uh, to understand how, how we uh, map with these data, uh, what these data, how these data are structured, what their, uh, what their uh, fit for purpose is. Uh, and uh, oftentimes I get the question, how do you map the ocean floor? Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's another, another one because we are so used, we are visual and uh, with, uh, even with Mars, we were able to, to see the topography of Mars right away mm-hmm. uh, from the animations that, that NASA showed us on our planet, on our water planet that type of electromagnetic energy does not see through water very well. Uh, And so there's, I I mentioned this Explore Mars uh, app that is available and hopefully that's that URL is in the chat now. It's, It's harder to map the ocean floor because we have to see through water. And in order to see through water, we use acoustics, we use sound. Electromagnetic energy, and so that's that is essentially how we are able to map, similar to how whales uh, map. In fact, there is a recent study uh, that shows how whale calls, the acoustics from the whale, can mm-hmm. actually penetrate uh, penetrate the seafloor to map what's beneath the seafloor as well as what's on it. Mm-hmm. But the principle is we send out pulses of sound from from a ship or from a vehicle. Uh, and we time the amount of time for that pulse to get down to the ocean floor, back to the instrument, turn that travel time into a distance, and then we go from there. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, really amazing. Yeah, really cool. Yeah. Wow. So there's, a, there's another issue that I wonder if we could tackle a little bit and maybe... Uh, it's part of, of, this is a lifelong learning issue, an informal learning issue, the idea not only of the harm to the ocean from plastics, but to illegal commercial fishing. Mm-hmm. Have, you, um, have you covered that topic uh, in any of your, your curricula? No, I'll give that question to you. That's, that's a question for you. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Uh, and I think at, at some point we will be doing uh, a learn uh, lesson uh, about this, but the uh, the question is how is GIS being used to limit illegal commercial fishing, 
And I would say simply that part of how GIS is being used is to catch it in the act if we can. The IUU fishing, the illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, if we can capture the signals uh, mm -hmm. from these fishing boats, uh, mm -hmm. if they have their automatic automated uh, uh, information system, their uh, tracking system turned on on their boat, uh, we can we can catch them in the act uh, in various areas that are uh, restricted from fishing, put that on a map, and hopefully send out authorities. That's mm -hmm. getting harder, though, mm -hmm. getting harder because the uh, illegal fishermen and fisher, maybe fisher women, fisher people, uh, are turning off those signals so that they can't be uh, tracked. So there's new technology uh, that can capture their radar uh, as they're communicating with each other or as they're communicating through radar frequencies. Mm -hmm. And we work with a, a couple of companies that specialize in capturing uh, those radar frequency signals and then integrating that with our technology, with our mapping software, again, mm -hmm. to, to catch them hopefully in the act or even uh, we're working with a, uh, a scientist who wants to be able to predict where they're going to go next. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, that, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. We have some, one more question before we, um, oh, okay. Let's, uh, I, we've got some additional questions here. So, uh, let's, let's see if we can go to, go to those. So, uh, one question is, uh, from Hunter Wilson and he asks as an undergraduate student interested in GIS and ocean conservation, what can I do to contribute in ocean conservation research? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some ideas there, Sandra? Hmm. To contribute to um, ocean conservation research. Um, well, yes, I, I would say to um, start by going on to Ezra's website and seeing what's, seeing what's already being done in terms of ocean conservation. And Don, I think you put some of those links in, some of the links are actually in the, in the chat. And um, I would also say join a community of ocean conservationists and um, just get your feet wet. Um, there is, just as cons ocean conservation is expansive, there are opportunities abound to get involved. I, and I don't think you really need to have um, scientific background, you just have to have an interest and then learn as you go. Uh, again, there are different various ways in which we all can become uh, ocean conservationists. Um, if mm -hmm. fifth graders can uh, be responsible for recycling, certainly, um, um, you know, everyone can, can do their part um, as well. So again, we are all living on an ocean planet, right? And we're all living on an island and we all have a responsibility to to care for the ocean and protect it. I, I would agree. Uh, and I, I, especially getting involved in, in the conservation community, conservation organizations, uh, getting an internship uh, mm -hmm. that has an ocean conservation research angle to it as well, because there's so many professors who conservation uh, research, even activism is a part of their of their research, and they're looking for for students to to help them on projects. Yes. So, uh, yeah, we can look out for for those uh, opportunities as well. Uh, another question uh, from Dr. Thomas uh, H. Mace: Are these tools useful for lakes, and are there size scale limitations? And this is a great question because oftentimes when we uh, when we uh, talk about uh, ocean conservation, we for, we forget about like the Great Lakes uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And these tools are absolutely suitable for for lake conservation. And in fact, many of the uh, the National Marine Protected Area System in the U.S. includes part of our Great Lakes. Yes. And uh, lakes in general uh, have uh, ecosystems that. They're, they're freshwater ecosystems, but they're still ecosystems that need conservation and protection. Uh, there are uh, size and scale limitations sometimes in terms of 
how uh, we are able to to get the data for lakes uh, at higher resolution, higher detail. Uh, and, and sometimes that is, oftentimes uh, that is dependent on the data collection uh, that is available for, for a lake uh, of a given size. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it, it is important to include uh, those uh, bodies of water as part of our, our conservation ethos as well. Sure, sure. Well, I, I have a question. Here is one, and it says, what advice would you give a teacher who is interested in getting their toes wet with GIS but isn't sure what to expect? That's a great one. Yeah. Um, I'll start, Don. Mm-hmm. I'd say uh, first explore the Ezria National Geographic resources, and I believe there may be some links uh, coming to the, the chat soon. Um, but uh, first explore the resources and see what uh, GIS, GIS is and how it can be used in different subject matters, right? Um, most importantly, I think, um, you know, get, give some thought to the impact that geographical thinking and GIS tools can have to awaken the world of exploration for your students. This kind of inquiry will help you to stay the course as you move through your learning path. GIS is vast and the capabilities are bound. Be a bit overwhelming. At least that, that's what my uh, experience was initially. But um, my advice would be to start slow, master the fundamentals, and be determined as you move incrementally, building your skills and agility. Uh, just as uh, Don mentioned, uh, we mentioned before, uh, for support, I would suggest joining a community of teachers currently using JS in the classroom, ask a lot of questions, and uh, again, the, the resources in the chat uh, will help you to get started. And also, Don, my Esri Hub page went live today. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. So glad you mentioned that. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm very excited about that. Uh, There are additional resources on the homepage. And uh, feel free, if you'd like, to reach out to me directly. And I'd love to help you get started with GIS in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's hard to, to, um, I I think you've covered the bases uh, there so well, Sandra. The the only thing that comes to mind uh, to me is... uh, when you said a community of teachers, mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm sure that your hub is going to create a digital community of sorts. And when mm-hmm. we are able to get back to meeting face to face and uh, workshops together, that will be really terrific. Yes. Well, we used to host um, the teachers teaching teachers GIS uh, workshops on our campus and in other places. And so okay. you literally had teachers who were helping other teach, teachers who had experience with GIS to help other teachers along and mm-hmm. to, to bring them along uh, on the journey. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I can't wait for that time. Uh, it's uh, building oh. is essential, right? For, for real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in, in terms of time here, uh, I think we are instructed to give one last uh ask uh, in terms of questions that may have come in from social media or the chat. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are no other other questions and I'm not seeing uh, others uh, come in. Uh, I think we will we will move up we will move to to wrapping this up although I hate to do it it's been I wish we could go on and on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thank you thank you Sandra thank you all so much for for joining us today and we we encourage you to check out all of our ocean resources all of our education resources our team is indeed posting uh the links in the chat for you now and these are for anyone interested in learning more about our work with the national geographic society and how esri and our partners are uh, addressing ocean conservation Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you so much sandra Well, thank you so much for having me, Don. It has been great. And again, I am, uh, if any of the educators would like to reach out to me directly, I'm I'm here. Please do. I'd love to hear from you. Don, it's been great. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, and Sandra, you've been a, a fantastic guest, our own special guest. Uh, and we will post uh, your email in the chat as well, if that's all right. That's and my, my email as well. And again, to everyone for watching and participating in this conversation. Uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Bye.